This is Dom Bettinelli, the CEO of SQPN, with a brief but very important message. For more than a decade, SQPN has produced the Catholic faith and pop culture podcasts that you love. We're a nonprofit organization, so it's only your generosity that lets us carry out our mission. We haven't run a fundraiser in two years, and that's why we need to ask for your help right now. Please make a pledge of whatever amount you can afford to help us continue providing your favorite podcasts, as well as exciting new ones we have planned. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. Thank you for your generosity. May we hear from you today? You're listening to episode 18 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries, both natural and supernatural, from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about John F. Kennedy's secret Dr. Feelgood. Uh, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So uh, uh, as we usually do, we want to remind you right up front to like Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on Facebook. We have a Facebook page to retweet the show on Facebook, I mean, retweet it on Twitter, share it on Facebook, uh, leave us comments, subscribe if you don't yet subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in your favorite podcast app or on YouTube where we post it as an audio only video. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, make sure to hit the bell to get notifications when we post new episodes and above all share the podcast with your friends to help us grow the community of listeners that's what we're here for is to reach more people uh folks as we as you've heard at the beginning of this podcast before as we began and as you've been hearing our message over the past uh week few weeks uh we're in the middle of our or co- closing in on the end of our giving campaign uh we've sqpn the starquist production network is the home of jimmy Akin's mysterious world and it produces a number of different podcasts uh, that explore the intersection of faith and pop culture and other interesting things like our mysterious world. And uh, in order to do that, we we rely on the goodwill and support of people like you, who are donors, who are our patrons, uh, patrons of the arts, uh, as as it were, uh, who help us to to pay the bills and to keep doing what we're doing. Um, we we have uh, a number of shows, and we've got a bunch of new shows planned. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is one of the our newest shows. It's super successful. We're very excited how you've all responded to it, uh, and we've been hearing some great things from people about about how they've enjoyed these shows. And we've got more of these kinds of shows coming, but we can only do that if we have your support uh, through sqpn.com slash give. And if you can go there and become a supporter and a patron of SQPN, we would greatly appreciate that, and that would help us continue our mission. And it's really important that you do. Uh, when we started Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, it was one of a number of new podcasts we launched. And we did that, you know, as a step of faith. We we stepped out in faith, assuming if we do these people, if we do these new podcasts, people will see the value in them and they'll help us uh, pay the bills to do them. I myself, I don't get any compensation for this. I'm doing this for free. But we do have expenses that uh, are brought that are involved in getting the show edited and uploaded and put in all the different places and hosted online and made available to you. We really need to cover those expenses or we can't continue the shows like this. So um, please, it's the season of giving. We're approaching the Christmas, the um, anniversary of God's greatest gift to us, his own son. And so please reciprocate by uh, giving to others, including SQPN. Once again, the place to go is sqpn.com slash give, G-I-V-E. Please become one of our regular uh, monthly supporters on Patreon. We have some wonderful thank yous that are related to the program uh, that deal with topics we've covered in the past. We'd love to send those to you, but please do support the show, sqpn.com slash give. Thank you. So today, uh, our as I said at the top, our topic is uh, John F. Kennedy's secret Doctor Feel Good. Now this 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 topic came out of left field for me because I'd never heard about this. I've heard the name, you know, the sort of as a phrase. Oh, dark, he's a Doctor Feel Good, and I've even this heard is where it came from. Yeah, well, and of course, in the movie The Princess Bride, we have Miracle Max, uh, right. which which is yeah. also the uh, reference to this guy. So what are we at? So in the 1960s, there was a doctor called. 
uh, Dr. Max Jacobson, who treated John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy, and many others, including many celebrities, um, with dangerous experimental drug combinations. Uh, now, I, I, I can't wait to hear more about this. Um, so the Secret Service knew about him, and they gave him, they're the one who gave him the code name Doctor Feelgood. I just I this guy I got a they got to have an office somewhere where they assign code names, and that's yeah. just gonna be like the best job. Uh, he was also nicknamed, as we said, Miracle Max. And so today we're gonna talk about who Max Jacobson is, what he was doing, and what the the results of what his, he was doing were. So uh, Jimmy, why don't you tell me you tell us you know uh, the audience who was Max Jacobson. Okay. Uh, he was a physician. He was born in 1900. In, it, it's actually, it, it, he's German, uh, he's of German origin, but where he was born, it was, it was one of those disputed areas, like, is it Poland or is it East Prussia? And um, he ended up uh, going to Berlin and being a doctor there. And then the Nazis happened. And he got wise before the start of World War II. He realized this is a really dangerous situation. I got to get out of here. So he immigrated uh, first to Paris and then to the United States. Uh, He left Germany about 1936. He ended up settling in Manhattan and he set up a medical practice there and he became a very well-known doctor in uh, on the Manhattan scene. He particularly catered to people who were in show business and the arts. So, you know, they have a big theater community, television community at the time, even some movies being made in New York at the time. And he really uh, catered to that group of people. He had a lot of celebrity clientele. Mm -hmm. And eventually his his practice expanded to include loads of influential people, including John and Jacqueline Kennedy. Interesting. And, uh, you know, as I think about it, there's a there's a pop culture sort of figure that we we see, especially in that time where, you know, various comedians and others would play the sort of a madcap doctor, kind of a crazy doctor. And he would always have a German accent. And I'm I'm guessing ah, this is be. why. Uh, so. Yeah. So what was. And, and, and like Miracle Max, he would from the Princess Bride, he would yeah. special he would take people who were only mostly dead and make them feel better. <laughs> That's right. So what was what was uh, Dr. Jacobson actually doing? What was what was his treatments? What what he's known for is now he had a medical degree and so he could administer lots of different treatments. But what he's known for are these injections. He had his own special combination of stuff that he referred to either as his miracle tissue regenerator or as his vitamin energy cocktail. And he was secretive about exactly what was in there. Patients who asked him report him saying things like, well, would you understand if I told you? <laughs> and, and you know, you think, and it was a plausible squelch because lots of people, I mean, if I told you this drug is Dexima whatever, you're not going to know what that is. Right. And so you just kind of trust your doctor. And so he was kind of secretive about it. Turns out there were vitamins uh, in in the injections, sometimes at least. There were also hormones and steroids and then it and it, and 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 it's a mixture of these things. It's not just like I'm going to give you a hormone injection now and then I'm going to give you a steroid. It's these are mixed together with even weirder things, including animal cells. Ugh. He would apparently take uh, extracts from animal organs, including an electric eel um, and like sheep and goat's blood and mix that in to this as well. He would use cells taken from human placentas. Um, In some of these, he had these little bits of metal or rock that he claimed were uranium, which um, he put in there to give help give it more energy. And that that actually is something that is kind of a callback to the early 20th century after radium was discovered. Radium, because it does release energy, people thought, oh, let's make medical preparations out of it and it'll give people more energy. And um, I want to talk about this in a future episode. Uh, People actually would like infuse radium into water and market it as radium water as a tonic that you could take to give you more energy. And there was this one guy who was rich. He was like a millionaire. 
and he would have just bottles of radium water every day. And he thought it worked really well for him and gave him lots of energy until his jaw fell off. <laughs> because what happens is radium occupies the same column on the periodic table as calcium. And that means your body sees it as calcium and says, hey, let's build bones with that. And so it starts to incorporate radium into your bones, particularly where your bones have suffered injury due to stress like your jaw from all that chewing. Ugh. Your body's always repairing that bone. And if you're drinking loads of radium water, you're incorporating radium into your jaw. So, um, but apparently Miracle Max hadn't learned that lesson and claimed at least to be using uranium in his preparations, uh, some of them. And then he also was using amphetamines, mm. lots and lots of amphetamines, and by some accounts, methamphetamines. And he was putting those in these injections as well. So when you're hopping people up on hormones, steroids, vitamins, and amphetamines, even if the pig and goat blood isn't, or the sheep and goat blood isn't doing much for you, the amphetamines might. So what's, what do amphetamines do for, for, the, for people who might not um, know? Basically, they they rev up your metabolism. Um, they're also known as speed. Right. So, uh, you know, students in college sometimes use speed to take, you know, to stay awake for tests. Back in this day, they were perfectly legal. Um, they weren't yet a restricted substance, and they were used in diet pills, for example. So housewives would use them to diet. Um, but if you take enough of them, they're, and in small doses, they do have therapeutic uses. But um, they basically they rev up your metabolism and they they give you they do give you more energy. They make they can also make you hyper and interfere with your judgment. That, and and they're addictive. Right. And and uh, Max Jacobson was one of a number of what became known as speed doctors that would provide sp speed for their patients, especially celebrity patients. That's probably where we're looking at the list of things where a lot of the feel good and energy boost was coming yeah. from was just from amphetamines in the system there. yes okay so uh so there's the content of this miracle drug that he's giving people but there was some controversy about how he he managed his practice too right yeah so you you can't just call up a medical supply house and order something with hormones steroids uranium human placenta and amphetamines <laughs> Um, that doesn't come ready made. So right. he was mixing the stuff himself. He he ran his office uh, like a chemist's lab. And so he was mixing, he'd order the raw supplies and then he'd mix it all together himself, apparently on the fly, changing the formulas, you know, regularly. It wasn't always the same. Um, he, he, by his own profession, was experimenting. Um, he also ran his lab in what was not viewed as a good way. He didn't have good labeling and record keeping practices. That was one of the things that later cost him his license. It was also said by people who saw it to be very dirty and disorganized. And he himself had, even though he was a, a, apparently uh, physically impressive during the early part of his career, he was supposed to be trim and handsome and very magnetic in his personality. Um, he would wear like a dirty lab coat spattered with blood and and people would be put off by that when they met him. And then they would start feeling better after he gave them a meth injection. So they would keep coming back despite the way he presented himself as a doctor. Um, he also was known for treating people without doing proper diagnostics on them. He would not take people's pulses. He would not take their blood pressure. And those are important things if you're about to give someone amphetamines to know what their heart is and blood pressure are doing before you ramp up their metabolism dramatically. He wouldn't do that. He instead would just look at people and diagnose them from, just from looking at them. Um, and then he, for 90% of his patients, he would let them self-inject amphetamines. He would, he would give them packages of, uh, they, they had like a grapefruit and his nurses would teach the patients how to give an injection using the grapefruit, and then they'd send them off with uh, doses of Max's miracle tissue regenerator so that they could um, <clears throat> inject themselves at home and wouldn't always have to be coming back to the office. Now, I should note, self-injection 
can sound scary for people who don't have to do it, but it's a perfectly respectable practice and is even necessary. I mean, you think of people who are insulin dependent diabetics, they need to self inject, you know, they, they, they need the insulin to help them process uh, food and they need food to live. So they need to be able to self inject at home. They can't run to the doctor's office every time they need an insulin shot. Um, similarly, people who are allergic to bee stings, let's say, they may need an EpiPen that they can keep on in, on their person or at least close by so that if they get stung by a bee, they can give themselves an, um, an adrenaline injection. But those are controlled things. Letting somebody self-administer amphetamines whenever you need a little pick-me-up is something entirely different right. and is going to feed addiction. Right. Interesting. And and so, you know, it, we mentioned that JFK it was probably his most well-known, you know, the president of the United States, most well-known of his uh, of his uh, patients, shall we say. Uh, but his his list of people that that he treated reads like a it's like a who's who of yeah. Hollywood and in, in, in uh, New York from the, you know, from the 50s and 60s. Yeah, it, it really does. So some of the people he is known to have treated include, so let's start with actors and actresses, Lauren Bacall, Ingrid Bergman, Humphrey Bogart, Yule Brenner, Montgomery Clift, Rosemary Clooney, Marlena Dietrich, Eddie Fisher, Judy Garland, Hedy Lamar, Liza Minnelli, Zira Mostel, Marilyn Monroe, Anthony Quinn, and Elizabeth Taylor. He also uh, treated the, the music conductor Leonard Bernstein, the true crime author Truman Capote, film producer Cecil B. DeMille and David O. Selznick, sports icon Mickey Mantle, musicians Thelonious Monk and Elvis Presley, uh, politician Nelson Rockefeller, and playwright Tennessee Williams. So just all the literati and glitterati that wow. you could think of from this age. And many of these people have, you know, they had... I mean, you 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 can't necessarily blame the 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 bad outcome in their life, their 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 um, tragic ends in some in some cases uh, necessarily on on these injections. I mean, their 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 whole lifestyle might have been a problem, but right. but but I noticed that a lot of these people dealt with addictions and uh, shortened lifespans and other issues, uh, perhaps related. Yeah, indeed. And um, I mean, some of them talked about it. I think Eddie Fisher, who I believe it was Eddie Fisher who gave him the nickname Miracle Max, um, talked about how his injections led him you know, to struggle with addiction for decades. And he didn't know what he was getting into because, um, as I mentioned, Jacobson was very reserved in telling people what was actually in the stuff he was giving them. I mean, he would some of his patients would say he told me it was vitamins. <laughs> You know, and didn't mention the the meth. Um, right. He's just this is my vitamin energy elixir, and um, so they thought they're getting a B twelve shot or something, and have no idea that it's got something as addictive as methamphetamines in it. So uh, now, one of these figures you mentioned is Cecil B. DeMille, the famous uh, producer and uh, director. Uh, what uh, the the circumstances with him and uh, Max Jacobson? are particularly yeah. interesting. Could you tell us about that? Yeah. So one of the things that happened as a result of his famous clientele who could afford, they were rich, so they could afford to like bring Max to them from great distances. And so when Cecil B. DeMille was filming the Ten Commandments in Egypt, he, he was having severe energy problems. The film was in a mess because of that. And so he flew Max over to Egypt to give him injections. So he gets over to Egypt. He does that. They complete the picture. Later, he's got a publicity tour he's got to do for the Ten Commandments. And so he brings Max with him to Europe for the publicity tour. And uh, there's a particularly uh, sort of amusing bit of the tour that Max got to witness where they went to see Pope Pius XII at Castel Gandolfo, which is the Pope's uh, summer residence. And um, and Jacobson was impressed by how they had like the hotel in Rome set up just the way that Cecil B. DeMille liked it. He apparently liked rocking chairs. And so they had a rocking chair for him there. <laughs> and and DeMille like had this presentation. He was supposed to, he was going to give like an $8,000 gift to the Pope for charity. 
uh, as part of the movie publicity. And he had this, you know, speech he wanted to give talking about how the movie, how important the movie is for faith and for the Italian people and stuff like that. And so he's out on the balcony practicing the speech he's going to give the Pope and he and is, isn't even aware of it. But a crowd is starting to gather in the street and Jacobson points out the crowd to him and DeMille like, you know, like waves to them and then goes back inside and sits in his rocking chair. Um, but then when they went to the to talk to the Pope and it's it's not clear here to me whether Jacobson had just received an injection or not or whether this was just nerves on his part. But the protocol when you're meeting the Pope is you don't talk until the Pope talks to you. So they have this receiving line. They're introducing all these people to the Pope. And um, before Pius XII has a chance to say anything to Cecil B. DeMille, he's so wound up, he just starts giving his speech about how important the film is and what it's going to mean for the Italian people and everything. <laughs> and he's just going on. And Pius XII can't get a word in edgewise. And finally, one of these cardinals, you know, Italian cardinals standing there is going like, echo, echo, which means hear, hear, enough, enough. Uh, you know, shut up. <laughs> and, and and so they kind of hustle Cecil B. DeMille off. And then he realizes, I've forgotten to give him the $8,000 check. So he has to run back and give him the check. <laughs> the, the dangers of um, uh, of Ma uh, Miracle Max's uh, uh, injection. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good one. So uh, so we mentioned, you know, that the, the topic we, we introduced as J you know, JFK's secret Dr. Feelgood. Yeah. What is it that John F. Kennedy needed to to see Doctor Feelgood about? Like, what was why would this this vital young you know president now now was he seeing him while he was president? Is that oh yeah okay? Oh, yeah. So why would this vital young youngest president ever? Why would he need to to be going to to to, to see Doctor Feelgood? Well, the Kennedys really wanted to project the idea that JFK was vital and young, and he was young. He was not vital. And this was kept from the press at the time, just like during World War II, the press had kept to themselves the fact that that FDR needed a wheelchair. And in the same way, they kept a lot of JFK's ailments uh, private. Um, he suffered, we now know, from Addison's disease, which is uh, um, adrenal insufficiency. Your body doesn't make enough adrenaline. And so that's going to cause energy problems right there. Um, he also had hypothyroidism. His thyroid didn't produce enough of the hormones it was supposed to. It produced a low amount. And so that also is going to bring your metabolism down. It's going to cause you energy problems. Then during World War II, he had suffered back injuries. Right. And these caused him a huge amount of back pain. He at times had to wear back braces. He would, uh, it, 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 he could not walk properly frequently due to the back pain. And so he had a number of diseases or conditions that um, they were keeping secret and that they really did not want to become public because uh, not just for political reasons, but also for global political reasons, because this is the Cold War and he's got his finger on the button and he's having to go toe to toe with Khrushchev. And um, and you really want your strong, vital president to be a strong, vital president. Mm. And before that, you also want to get into office. And so um, the 1960 election was really close. And, you know, I, it, it's amazing to me that presidential candidates have the energy they do to campaign uh, in the first place with the intensity they do. And so he was having uh, problems on the campaign trail. And that's when he first started to uh, be treated by Max Jacobson. He got a referral. Uh, they set up a, a, an, an appointment very confidentially, very hush-hush. Uh, and Jacobson started giving Kennedy injections while he was still a candidate. In fact, he gave him an injection right before the famous televised debate with Nixon. Mm. So you watch that debate where Kennedy is perceived... Nixon it, it was perceived to have won it by people who listened on the radio. Right. That he was more articulate and cogent. But in terms of how they looked on camera, Kennedy was just projecting this vital magnetic personality image. Because and it was the a, first televised debate, right? The first yeah, pres televised presidential I, debate. It's certainly one of the first, maybe the first. Yeah. 
and uh, and so Kennedy looked vital and very energetic. And and what I think it was what was it uh, Nixon um, Had was five sweating. Five o'clock shadow and was sweating. Yeah. Okay. Um. And and part of the reason that Kennedy looked so good and so energetic was that he had just gotten a shot of amphetamines. Apparently. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Just, I mean, looking back from our 21st century perspective, that just seems unbelievable that, you know, the, that the presidential candidate had been injected with amphetamines, amphetamines right before uh, the debate. How else did this affect Kennedy? Well, um, it, he, he continued to be treated by uh, Jacobson after he got into office. And we know that Jacobson came to the ho- White House at least 34 times because his name is on the visitor's logs. And over the space of time he was doing that, he could be there three to four times a week mm. to treat Jack Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy. Um, whenever they, uh, whenever Kennedy felt the need to see Jacobson, they would call his office in New York and say that Mrs. Dunn, D-U-N-N, Mrs. Dunn needed an appointment. And that was the code name for Kennedy to keep his name private and off the books. Right. So... Um, so then uh, Jacobson would fly down to Washington and administer the treatment. Um, it, it had potentially, I mean, it would perk Kennedy up and make him feel better and help him deal with the back pain. It also may have exacerbated some of his sexual escapades. Now, these preceded his treatment by Jacobson, so we can't lay them all at that. But it, it, amphetamine use is known to have an effect um, on libido and, <laughs> and judgment um, and judgment. <laughs> right. And some of his, uh, some of Jacobson's other patients have talked rather graphically about exactly what some of the physical symptoms of that were. Um, but, um, but it's possible that this exacerbated the situation. It then in 1961 may have caused him a real problem because after the Bay of Pigs, he had a really tense summit in uh, Vienna with Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of the Soviet Union. And Khrushchev looked at Kennedy as this young, untested guy who had balked at the Bay of Pigs because he didn't follow through with air support and so forth. So he was kind of looking at Kennedy as a weakling and someone, and they were going to test each other out at this summit. And so, um, Kennedy brought Jacobson with him to Europe, and when they're getting ready for the first meeting with Khrushchev, uh, Kennedy comes to Jacobson and says, I've been told he's about to show up. This is going to be a long meeting. I really need a shot so that I can get through this meeting and won't look weird if I like have to get up and move around out of my chair from the back pain and stuff. So to get him through this long meeting... Uh, Jacobson apparently gave him a big dose. Mm. Well, then Khrushchev doesn't show up for a long time, and the dose is starting to wear off. And so when Khrushchev finally does show up, Kennedy asks for another injection and gets it. And then in the middle of the long meeting, Kennedy comes out to use the bathroom, and Jacobson is sitting there, you know, uh, to monitor the situation. And, And Kennedy says... And his speech is slurred at this point. He says, I need another one. And Mm. Jacobson is like, I've already given you two. I, I, you know, this is dangerous. I can't do this. But Kennedy insisted. And so Jacobson gave him a third shot and he went back into the meeting. And apparently, according to Kennedy, the meeting was just a disaster. He gave an interview, uh, I think it was to the New York Times afterwards, where he talked about how Khrushchev just laid into him and it was a, it was the worst day of his life and it was just an incredibly bad meeting. And that may have been because he was out of his mind, and partly because he was out of his mind on drugs. Also, um, now Jacobson's office had been mysteriously burgled mm. previous to this. And there are conflicting accounts about, was it the FBI it looks like it looks like at least in one case it may have been the FBI, but also the KGB. Hmm. And according to some accounts, um, Khrushchev knew about Jacobson because they'd raided his office and they knew the kind of things he was injecting people with. 
And he may have deliberately maneuvered Kennedy into this position, such as by showing up really late oh. so that um, whatever he had taken would start to wear off. And so um, it, it, Jacobson's ministrations may have played a role in the in the 1961 Vienna summit event that did not go well. Interesting. And may have emboldened uh, Khrushchev then to put missiles in Cuba, leading to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Right. So the idea that, uh, you know, at this probably one of the lowest moments of the Cold War, the most one of the most dangerous moments of the Cold War, that one of the two leaders with their fingers on the button was running around hopped up on methamphetamines um, while the other one, uh, you know, knew about it and was egging him on. I mean, mm -hmm. this this is incredibly and, and, and as you say, perhaps led to the uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, it might have emboldened Khrushchev to, to go there. That that's pretty astonishing. I mean, this that means that, you know, Max Jacobson you know, is is that the at the 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 the, the an inflection point? Shall we say mm -hmm. uh, for modern history? That's amazing. So, what else? What else do we have from uh you know from Jacobson's time at you know treating Kennedy? Do we have any other stories? Yeah. So, uh, I'm sure people have seen footage of the famous "Happy Birthday, Mr. President." Uh, video of Marilyn Monroe singing "Happy Birthday" to John F. Kennedy. That happened in 1962. And she's doing it in this really breathy, sexualized way um, that she apparently practiced for extensively before she did it. And and she was having an affair with Kennedy and with his brother, Robert Kennedy. Um, but she uh, she was also one of Jacobson's patients. And apparently Jacobson was there to give the president a shot before his birthday party. And she needed one, too. So he apparently gave her a shot in the neck right before she did the happy birthday song. So when you see that video, according to the accounts we have from an eyewitness, Marilyn was also uh, hopped up on drugs as she gave, as she delivered that song, <laughs> wow. um, which is kind of a, you know, a minor thing. But all of this gets serious from Robert Kennedy's perspective, because Robert Kennedy is whatever his his flaws are, he cares about his brother and he cares about what's happening to his brother with all these drugs. And, and he's, he's the attorney general of the United States at the same time. Right. Okay. So what now, happens so, there? So Ken, Robert Kennedy starts an investigation and he gets some, uh, some of the serum that uh, Jacobson was administering and has it analyzed. And he finds out what's in it. And he then confronts his brother about it. And JFK, uh, and I'm going to substitute the actual word Kennedy used isn't much worse than this, but it is a little worse. Uh, Kennedy said, I don't care if it's horse pee, it makes me feel good. Or in some accounts, he said, I don't care if it's horse pee, it works. Right. And so Kennedy was was determined to go ahead using this stuff at this point. This is 1962. And RFK then ran in to Jacobson and one of his uh, associates in the White House as they were, I guess, either coming to treat Kennedy or just leaving and told them to go back to New York. And he said, what are you doing here? You and then he used an anti-Semitic slur because Jacobson was Jewish, as was his associate. And um, and this caused Jacobson to be very offended. Uh, he had already escaped Nazi prosecution or Nazi persecution um, due to his Jewish background. He didn't want to see this happening in his new, newly adopted country. And so he apparently contacted the White House and said, I'm not coming there anymore. Um, hmm. So that prompted JFK to reach out to Jacobson and to want to come see him so they could bury the hatchet. And so uh, Kennedy came up to the Carlisle Hotel in New York for a meeting with Jacobson. And uh, Jacobson comes there. He injects Kennedy. And as they're waiting for the for the drug to take effect, um, Kennedy basically apologizes, says, please don't let this be a barrier. Um, you know, think of 
the good of the country of your adopted country and the good it's doing in the world, you know, and and he apparently was able to reconcile with Jacobson and, you know, smooth over his feathers after the problematic confrontation with Bobby. Um, so Jacobson then leaves. And then it turns out he's overdosed the president mm. and JFK, as the drug really starts kicking in, becomes increasingly paranoid. He strips off all of his clothing and starts running around the hallways naked, waving his arms. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. So the Secret Service is not happy about this, including because with the president running around the halls, guess what? The press is downstairs <laughs> with cameras. Right. Okay? <laughs> so you could just imagine what could happen here. Oh, wow. So so they called a prominent New York psychiatrist named, named Lawrence Hatterer and brought him in, and they forcibly restrained the president while Hatterer injected him with some stuff to calm him down and like a, a sedative and an antipsychotic or something like that. And, and then, and waited for the effect of, uh, of, of, of uh, Jacobson's injection to go away. And so they were able to deal with the situation, but you could just imagine what that would have been like having the president of the United States <laughs> Paranoid and naked, running around waving his arms in hotel in hotel hallways. <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny, but it's tragic and scary at the same time. Yes, yes. And so, needless to say, after this kind of event, um, Kennedy's other doctors at the White House kind of put their foot down and and fired Jacobson and said they can't treat the president anymore. Um, it's unclear. To what it, it's unclear whether that actually stopped, though. It seems that if he did continue to treat him, it 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 was not as much. One of the things that's been noted is that after Jacobson was fired in '62, Kennedy's leadership actually improved; that he mm. became a steadier, more even-handed, and dependable leader compared to what it, he was previously. But on the other hand, he did continue to have at least social contact with um with uh Jacobson and and other people like Jackie Kennedy did as well. In fact, it's claimed that um that it was some of Jacobson's injections that helped Jackie get through the funeral after JFK was assassinated. Um that she just needed that to get out of the despair and be able to function publicly. Mm. Um so Jacobson did have some ongoing contact with the Kennedys, but if he was treating them, it wasn't nearly as much. Okay. So, so following, um, his uh, firing of, of once or another, at least, you know, as far as we know, uh, what happened eventually to, uh, to Jacobson? What, like, what was his uh, ultimately, you know, how, uh, what, what came of him? Well, this, the story is, is sad. Um, he himself, he, and he defended this by saying, I'm experimenting on myself because before, which is the classic mad scientist thing to do, only it doesn't always give you superpowers. Um, right. But his argument was, before I give other people these preparations, I need to see what their effects are, so I'm going to use them on myself. Well, so he was self-injecting, and he became an intense user to where he would go, he would do 24-hour days with no sleep. Mm. Um, so he was just giving him an, an amphetamine injection every couple of hours. Um he was also doing that for people who were giving injections to people around him, including his wife, Nina, who died in 1964. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics raided uh, Jacobson's office where he was mixing all the drugs in 1965. Um, in 1969, uh, one of his patients died named Mark Shaw. Mark Shaw was famous at the time as a photographer who had taken a lot of photos of uh, the Kennedy family. He was kind of the Kennedys. I don't know if he was their favorite photographer, but he was certainly very close to them. He was also apparently a CIA uh, agent. Hmm. Um, but uh, in any event, he was a uh, longtime patient of, of Max's. And when he died, Max's attorney contacted the medical authorities and insisted there be no autopsy, that he had died of a heart attack. Well, the coroner did an autopsy anyway, found no evidence of heart disease, but did find evidence of long-term amphetamine poisoning. Wow. And so that's apparently what killed Mark Shaw. 
in the next year, 1970, President Nixon uh, and well, Congress passed and President Nixon signed the Controlled Substances Act uh, that began to regulate a lot of these things more closely uh, as part of Nixon's newly launched war on drugs. And so Jacobson and his shenanigans are not all, but part of the reason that we now have or came to have the war on drugs. Um, in 1972, the New York Times did an expose on Jacobson and it's really weird, um, but at the time, and so remember, this is in the phase where Jacobson is in, intensely using amphetamines, so he's got these delusions of grandeur kind of thing that that tweakers can have. Right. And um, And so when the New York Times is interviewing him, he thinks this is finally going to bring him the recognition that he deserves that he's going to be portrayed as this great humanitarian that's a benefactor of mankind with his daring treatments that have brought so much good to so many people, when in fact they're writing an expose on him. And and so he was very unhappy with the results. Um, and so were the New York Board of Regents, which after a series of hearings yanked his medical license in 1975. Mm. And he and he tried to get it back, uh, but he didn't, and he ended up passing away in 1979. Okay, uh, and given he was born in 1900, so he it, yeah he lived it, to be almost 80. Yeah, so he it's it's difficult to say whether he shortened his own life, but he could, it can't have helped. <laughs> no, it didn't. Certainly didn't help. Although he did do other things to take care of himself, he was known even after he lost his license, he would like. Go. He lived in an apartment in New York. He would go down to the swimming pool of the apartment every day and do a bunch of laps to keep right. himself in shape. So, I mean, this you know, this is uh, we've we've talked about you know, for about thirty minutes or so about Max Jacobson. This can't be everything we uh, that there is to know about him. No, no, there's loads more uh, which we really can't go into. But with him treating all of those celebrities, well, they all wrote biographies. They've all got their own stories of what happened with him. So it's he actually shows up in all kinds of different celebrity biographies. Um, and he's even though he's not well known today, he was a big guy on the scene back in the 60s and 70s. And if you are interested, there is a lot more uh, to know about him, including other people who um, who who had various experiences with him in the further resources. We'll talk a little bit about that. OK. So we usually talk, you know, uh, we take perspectives of the you know, reason perspective and faith perspective. Um, what's there to, to, to look at in from a reason perspective on uh, Max Jacobson? Well, from a reason perspective, he was an out-of-control doctor. He was not following proper medical protocols for his day. You don't just diagnose people by looking at them and then give them something like amphetamines without even knowing what their heart is doing or what their blood pressure is, that's insane and would have been ridiculous even back then. On the other hand, um, and at the time, amphetamines were were legal and uh, drug laws were a lot looser. And so we shouldn't, and not as much was known about them. And so we shouldn't judge him from a reason perspective by what we understand about these things today. Some of what he was doing, even though it was out of bounds, it would have been more reasonable then than it would be now. They certainly had different attitudes toward uh, things like, you know, uh, you know, radioactive materials or yeah. and other and, and just even the capability of science to improve life in these uh, these ways of uh, use, using pharmaceuticals and other things to to improve life more so than, say, diet and exercise or other things that we do today. It's just a different perspective. So. Um, from a faith perspective, is there much to, to say about uh, Max Jacobson? Well, obviously, we can't pass judgment on his soul. That's something that's known only to God. Um, one thing we can say, though, is he does seem, you know, and there are people who have different perspectives on him, but one thing that's objectively true about him is he never got rich off this. He could have charged his celebrity clients large sums and gotten rich, and he didn't. Uh, in fact, he treated a lot of people without ever being paid. And so for whatever reason, you know, he, he did he chose not to become rich. And that can be read as a sign in his favor, you know, that he was a genuine humanitarian trying to do humanitarian work. 
And even if he enjoyed all the attention and so forth or the control over his patients or whatever you want to say, he wasn't just in it for the money. And um, he wasn't being thoroughly selfish here. So you can say that. It looks like, I mean, there's a case that he was sincerely thinking he's helping people. His attitude when the New York Times was preparing its expose shows that. He thought, I'm a humanitarian. I'm helping all these people. Um, But his own drug use, which was intensive, certainly warped his judgment on a number of different fronts. And so um, even though we can't uh, obviously pass any judgment on his soul, that combination of factors, you know, trying to do good, not getting rich and having impaired judgment um it 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 speaks well of the possibility at least of his salvation okay so uh so what's the the bottom line about uh dr feelgood here jacobson uh may well have been well meaning but he was a tragically flawed figure who played a largely forgotten role in 20th century american history but yeah. it's it's yeah. very interesting, but uh, something a lot of people don't know about and something that's thus rather mysterious. Very good. So what are some further resources if someone's interested in finding out more about uh, Dr. Max Jacobson? Uh, what are some further resources people can, can look to? In the show notes, I have a link to uh, Wikipedia's article on him. I also have links to a couple of um, uh other articles that document, because people can say, well, anybody can put anything on Wikipedia. So I included some other articles from other perspectives, including like an article from Psychology Today that talks about uh, Jacobson. Um, I also have a link to uh, his to the book, Dr. Feelgood by Richard Lertzman and William Burns, which is a, um, a very interesting read on uh, Jacobson. And uh, I also have a link to a YouTube documentary made by one of Max's former patients. And it's interesting in particular to compare the book by Lertzman and Burns with the documentary, which interviews a lot of Max's former patients. Um, you get kind of complementary perspectives. Uh, the, the book authors tend to be, even though they do try to understand him, they seem to be more negative. Mm. towards Max and and kind of have a harsher assessment of his actions. But the patients are sort of all over the map. Some of the patients are very bitter. Other patients are much more like, no, I mean, he did good uh, and he helped me. And some are kind of in the middle. Um, so you, you kind of have uh, an interesting blend of perspectives between those two resources. So I recommend them both. Excellent. So... Um... Great. So, so folks, go go to our show notes at sqpn.com and uh, look for these resources. Uh, so uh, we also, our next uh, segment is we talk about is your mysterious feedback from the listeners. And uh, our first bit of feedback is on the Tunguska episode we did. And that's from uh, listener Dan, who says, I've really enjoyed this new podcast. Can't wait for the next one. When I saw that the latest podcast was about the Tunguska event, I couldn't wait to see what you guys had to say. I was a bit surprised they didn't mention my favorite theory about what caused the event, Tesla, by which it means Nikola Tesla, I think. Not, I've, not the modern motor car company. <laughs> exactly. I've included an article about Tesla, which has a lot of good information about his experiment and a good explanation of how he may have caused the Tunguska event with an energy weapon he was developing. Yeah. So Nikola Tesla is a fascinating character uh, from the early 20th century, and we'll definitely be talking about him in a, in a future episode or more. Um, he is he's a really interesting guy, and we will be getting to Nikola Tesla. Excellent. So our next fee feedback is from uh, Carolyn Lally on YouTube on our uh, Soviet the, the Soviet Doomsday System episode. She says, I recall seeing a U.S. Air Force documentary in Catholic elementary school on the distant early warning line. It was built during the Cold War to give early warning of Soviet attack. From a standing start in December 1954, many thousands of skilled workers were recruited, transported to the polar regions, housed, fed, and supplied with tools, machines, and materials to construct physical facilities, buildings, roads, tanks, towers, antenna, airfields, hangars, in some of the most hostile and isolated environments in North America. The construction project employed about 25,000 people. She says you could find the documentary on YouTube. 
cool. I'll have to take a look for that. I also remember hearing about the Dew Line uh, back when uh, I was a boy, um, and these things were, I guess, not talked about quite as much. At least not in certainly not in my circles. But uh, the Dew Line or Distant Early Warning Line was a set of listening stations that were set up to watch for an incoming uh, Soviet nuclear attack over the polar ice cap. And that could then give us an early, hopefully give us an early enough alert to do something about it. Interesting. And y yes, actually, uh, here in Massachusetts on Cape Cod, there is a a, uh, a later version of that, which mm -hmm. looks out over the Atlantic Ocean. It's a giant. Um, over the horizon radar. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge trapezoidal building that just it's, it's really science fiction. -y. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it looks out over the, over the horizon like that. Very interesting. Uh, be worth looking for that uh, film on YouTube. Uh, Kelly uh, writes on Facebook, when you mentioned the dead hand devices, I was reminded of an article I read about the Russian shortwave radio station nicknamed The Buzzer that no one claims to run or, or takes, uh, takes responsibility for running. Some conspiracy theories claim it's part of a dead hand system. And it may be. Um, I'm familiar with The Buzzer, and we will be talking about The Buzzer and other so-called similar uh, kinds of stations like number stations. Uh, in a future episode, and it it may be that the buzzer is one that it uh, has been part of the dead hand or perimeter system. Excellent. And uh, listener Bennett on Facebook says, "I thought you might like to read about the UK's low tech version of perimeter, if you didn't already know." And he included a link to a Wikipedia article on letters of last resort. Yeah, this is really fascinating. Um, I hadn't been aware of it, but letters of last resort are sealed letters that are prepared by the Prime Minister of England for what to do in case a nuclear war has occurred and all contact with the British government has been cut off. So um, what are the subcommanders supposed to do in that situation? And there are a number of different options that uh, prime ministers are typically presented with. Uh, they, if, if since the letters have never been used, we're not entirely sure what options have been included in them because they're destroyed without being opened when the new prime minister comes in. But some of the proposed options include things like launch a counterattack, don't launch a counterattack, go to a, an allied country like the United States or Australia and put yourself under their command and become part of their Navy, things like that. Um, so um, I it, uh, thanks, Bennett, for that. And by all means, folks, look up Letters of Last Resort on Wikipedia. It's interesting. Mm. So uh, let's get to our mysterious headlines of the week. Jimmy, what are what are some mysterious headlines that you've seen? So uh, the Daily Star has an article about a Dutch uh, businessman who has built a life-size reconstruction of Noah's Ark. It's, it's built out of wood to the uh, specifications found in Genesis. Um, he did it in part to show that it would have been possible for Noah and his family to build such a, a, a vessel. Uh, he he did it um, in a small space of time, just a few years with a small number of people. And now he's got it uh, set to sail and he hopes to sail it to where else? Israel. Of course. So um, <laughs> if you want to check that out, uh, we've got a link there to the article on the Daily Star about the new life-size reconstruction of Noah's Ark. Excellent. Uh, and uh, another headline? Uh, Gizmodo is reporting about uh, the ISS robot Simon, which is a kind of, it's shaped like a basketball. It's about the size of a basketball. It has a, a screen on it that can do different things like display a, a kind of cartoon face. And it's basically an Alexa. Um, they have it up on the International Space Station and they were doing a video of it to demonstrate its capabilities it can also move around. It has fans, so in microgravity, it can control where it's facing and move up and down and around the cabin. And uh, they were doing this video to demonstrate its capabilities. A German astronaut was talking to it, and it started to go all HAL 9000 on him. <laughs> um, it, it's really amazing to watch. He's, he's having it play some music from the German techno band Kraftwerk. And then he, at the, about the four-minute mark in the video, which is in the, art, which is in the, the article that I link, um, at about the four minute mark, he says, okay, enough music. Let's now start a uh, video feed from your front mounted camera, which it does, but it's like stuck on the music and keeps talking about the music and he can't get it to stop talking about the music. And then it starts to say things like, don't you like it here with me? 
Why are you being so mean? Please don't be so mean. And it's also like starting to un- to up raise and lower itself in the cabin for no apparent reason. And so it's, it's not the most promising beginnings for AI in space, but it's definitely worth checking out the video. There's something about AI in space that just that drives them crazy. Uh, although it, it does sound a lot like uh, some German techno music bands that I've known who just can't stop talking about <laughs> German techno. Great. Well, thank you, folks, for all of your uh, wonderful feedback. And please keep it coming. We love to we love to get your feedback. And we uh, and we, we love the these headlines, which we'll, we'll include links to. So that's it from us on uh, doc, Dr. Feelgood, uh, JFK's secret Dr. Feelgood. Uh, so what do you think of, of what we talked about? Did you know about him? Do you have any uh, other information about him? Uh, let us know by going to sqpn.com slash mysterious or to the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Find the link to this episode and leave some feedback there. Or you can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. You can find relevant links from our discussion, uh, like the further resources that Jimmy mentioned, or to the Mysterious Headlines on our show notes on sqpn.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Don Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. This is Don Bettinelli again. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll help us keep producing the podcast you love. Thank you for your generosity. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give.